Uh, good morning again. Welcome to Life Point Crossing. My name's Ross. Listen, I alluded to this earlier, but uh, we had something amazing happen this week that we want to share with everybody. Someone here's a little bit more of the story as to how this happened, because this is a little bit strange, but uh, I was contacted and said, you know, I- I'm ready to be baptized. I said, okay, that's great. That's the, like one of the greatest things I could possibly hear. Let's find a Sunday to do this. And he said, I- I'd really like to do it on a weeknight. I just said, well, okay, Look, the, the being public about this is really part of what, what it is, so we really like to do it when people are here. And he said, well, but a weeknight is when I'll have more of my friends and family who would be able to actually come and see it and be a part. And I thought, that's not something I've ever heard before, but it does seem to work with the idea, so all right, I, I suppose we can make that happen. And so on Wednesday, there were like probably 30 or 40 people here to celebrate Gene Mendoza taking the plunge into baptism. And this is one of those stories where, not to go into, but like this is, he's been coming here since before I was here. This goes all the way back to Pastor Dennis. And anyway, here is the beautiful culmination of all of that that we can celebrate together here. God does great things. God does great things. He changes hearts. That, Amen. All right. Now I got to preach. <laughs> Welcome back to, let's see, we, there we go. Welcome back to Stand Alone. We've been talking about things and, and how everyone likes the idea of going against the crowd and doing their own thing. But of course, it's everyone, so then that makes you part of the crowd. And so the thing that really nobody else does, nobody does that, as evidenced by the fact that nobody does it. And so uh, the things we've been talking about, I don't know that they've necessarily been things that literally nobody else is going to do, but they will put you in a very distinct minority. They're not necessarily considered normal. They're maybe not what would be easy or what somebody might want to choose in the moment, but they are explicitly biblical. And so part of what that means is if you're here and you're interested in Jesus or the Bible or church or any of those things, but you haven't really committed to following Jesus, then you get each week a little bit of a peek inside what it might be like, but you can kind of take it under advisement, do whatever you decide to do. Those of us like myself who have committed to following Jesus, we're under authority. These are the orders, so we don't really get a choice at this point. But part of the good news that I hope you've been seeing is that Every single time, it ends up to actually be to our benefit, to your benefit. Uh, Some of these things, like I think it was two weeks ago, we talked about voluntary servanthood. Sounds terrible. Who would choose that? But then it turns out to be not only how we lose ourselves, but how we also find ourselves and the people that God created us to be and really the life that he has for us. And so every one of these, I think, turns out to be, in fact, wildly beneficial. And so that's very convenient. And not only is today no exception to that, however, it's going to be something that is really going against the grain of what most people do. It's not easy. It's not common. It's not natural. If you do this, you might really, truly find yourself standing alone, not only among our society, but just people kind of wherever there have been human beings. And so a couple of months ago, I saw a little thing uh, that made the rounds on social media. Probably some of you saw it as well. And it was a little story. I'm sure it's not true, but it was interesting. It pictured a person going through a drive through for breakfast, and as they were at the, the uh, speaker where they take the order, they took maybe a little longer than people would like or would normally be the case, and so the person behind them became very impatient, gesturing wildly, honking, super, super rude. And so what the driver does is when they pull up to the first window then to pay, they pay for not only their meal, but also the meal of the person behind them. When they advance then, so you're now 
at the, the window where you pay and the rude person behind them is at the window, or you're where you pick up your food, the person behind them, the rude person is at the, the window where you pay, they're of course told that, nope, you don't owe anything, the person in front of you has paid for your meal, and so now everything changes. And you look in the rear view and they're mouthing, I'm sorry, I, thank you, thank you. It, they just probably are very embarrassed that the person that they were super rude to has repaid them with this kindness, and it, everything changes. And then at the window where you pick up your food, you show them both receipts, say, no, these are both mine, I paid for all this, you take your food and theirs, and then drive away. <laughs> yeah. Um, the, the jerk has to then go through the line again and maybe learn some patience and some kindness in the process. Well, I think we will all agree that the topic for today would be considered very, very unusual. But I also think that on some level, it's something that really everybody is for, or would say they're for, or they do, or they try to do. But this is a situation where there's kind of a big umbrella idea, and everybody's for the big umbrella idea. But Jesus is not that impressed with the big umbrella idea, so what he does is he says, here, let's go to this very specific spot underneath the umbrella, where most people would say, well, okay, well, I mean, not like that, though. Like, I'm for big umbrella, but we've got to be a little bit selective, don't we? Because nobody's against being good to people. At least nobody's going to say it or say it like that. We kind of talked about something similar earlier in this series even, where everyone's going to say, well, I love people, I treat all people with kindness, let's choose kind, and, and that's all good, and that sounds very good, but it mostly has to do with people who treat us in specific ways, right? Generally, we want to be kind to everybody who's good to us, or maybe even strangers or people we don't know, but there are some people who we have very good reason to not treat well. Right? What if someone comes up to me, just insults me? What am I supposed to do? Say, well, here, come here, we, we made some space for you under the be nice to people big umbrella. Nah, forget that, man, get wet right? What, am, what, what, what do you want me to do? And it turns out that Jesus and Scripture are, in fact, very specific on what ac actually not to do and to do. We'll be starting today in 1 Peter 3. We have a couple different places to look, but here's it says, well, not, what not to do, don't repay evil for evil. It seems like that would be a pretty fair repayment, but it says not to. It says, don't retaliate with insults when people insult you. Well, then what am I supposed to do? This is normal, this is natural, this is what anybody would do. So, what, you want me to do something else instead? Well, it says, well, yeah, instead, pay them back with a blessing. Doesn't really seem like much of a payback, does it? Uh, and, and besides, I don't want to do that. Why, why would I do that? I, of course I don't want to do that. Well, Peter knows that you're not going to want to do that, but he still thinks it's a good idea that you should really try. And so he says, well, here's why, is because that's what God has called you to. Like, oh, right, but, but then if I repay the insult with a blessing, who's going to bless me? He has that covered too. God will. He, he, he will bless you when you do it. Just so we know it's not some crazy misunderstanding and some weird one-off in Scripture, here's Paul in Romans 14, never pay back evil with more evil. Isn't it amazing how these start with almost the exact same words? Don't repay evil for evil. Now, never pay back evil with more evil. What should I do? Well, do things in such a way that everyone can see you are honorable. Do all that you can to live at peace with everyone. Okay, well, do all that I can. Would that include paying back a blessing for an insult or not repaying evil for evil? Well, yeah, I guess it would. Do all that you can to live at peace with everyone. Would everyone include the people who are insulting me or paying me evil? Well, yeah, I, I guess it would. We skip down just a couple verses in the same chapter here. Dear friends, never take revenge Leave that for the righteous anger of God. For Scripture say, I will take revenge, I will pay them back, says the Lord. All right, and you kind of like that part. But now still, well, what do I do? These are my enemies, I have to do something. So it says, well, instead, if your enemies are hungry, watch them starve. Oh, feed them. They're thirsty. Give them salt tablets. <laughs> no, give, give, give them something to drink. Why, why would I do that? Well, in doing this, you will heap burning coals of shame on their head. Don't let evil conquer you, 
which does kind of sound terrible, but conquer evil, which actually kind of does sound awesome, but how do you conquer evil? Well, I, like, there's a song that I listen to on occasion called At War With War. Every time I hear it, I think, man, I think you're going to lose. You don't, you don't conquer war with war, you conquer war with peace. How do you conquer evil? You don't conquer evil with more evil. You conquer evil by doing good. That does sound pretty airtight. That does sound pretty specific. These are people who really, they have done you wrong. They are candidates for revenge. But what does it say that you're supposed to be nice to them? Give them a blessing. Give them, feed, feed your enemy when they're hungry. And just so... Uh, since, since we're on a roll here, Jesus himself, as famously recorded in Matthew 5, says, you've heard the law that says, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. And of, of course, that's normal. That's what most people do. You're good to the people who are good to you. And the people who are your enemies, I mean, they're your enemies. They're your enemies for a reason. They probably did you something really wrong. They're terrible people. Obviously, you're going to hate your enemies. But I say, no, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. In that way, you will be acting, here's who you're going to be like now, as is, is true children of your Father in heaven. How does that mean? What, what do you mean? Because he gives sunlight to both the evil and the good alike. Right? If you love only those who love you, what reward is there for that? Even corrupt tax collectors do that much. If you are good to the people who are good to you and you're bad to the people who are bad to you, who are you acting like? You're acting exactly like your enemies. They're good to their friends too. Right? And so now you're acting exactly like the people who you're mad at because of the way they act. Here's who you're not acting like, is our Father in Heaven, who says, if, if you're kind only to your friends, how are you different from anyone else? Even pagans do that. Okay, so I'm not supposed to be like everyone else. Who am I supposed to be like? You are to be perfect even as your Father in Heaven is perfect, who sends the blessings of rain and sunlight on the evil and the people who hate him and rail against him and the godly who love him and worship him. That is what is, you're supposed to do is different from what most people do, isn't it? Which is the very premise of Jesus' statement that he started out with. Like, we all know what it is to, to be kind to our friend or our neighbor and hate our enemy because that's normal, that's natural. Jesus is calling us to something different. Most people don't do this. Most people won't want to do this. Even most people who say they believe in kindness and being nice to everybody, like, okay, well, I mean, I didn't mean like that everybody, right? Like, these, these people, I've decided they're terrible. That's got to be different. But it's clear, it's explicit, it's repeated, not to go too deep into it, but Peter and Paul, even in what they write, are citing portions of the Old Testament. So this wasn't even completely new when Jesus started saying things like this. He said it a little more clearly, maybe, a little more compelling and more memorable, but it wasn't so completely out of nowhere. So never repay evil for evil. In fact, if your enemy's hungry, give them food. He said, pay back blessing for insult. Love your enemies. Pray for the people who hurt you. Now you're not doing just what's normal. Now you're standing alone and doing the hard things. And it's a little unfortunate that I feel like I have to say this, but just very quickly, it seems to me like most of the time where I hear somebody say that they do this or have done this, it's in the kind of malicious compliance way of doing, well, I did exactly the, what it said word for word, but in the exact opposite of the spirit of what's being said, right? Like this, this guy came up to me and he was rude. And so you know what I did? I just paid him back with a blessing. I said, sir, I hope you get over your little man syndrome very, very soon. And then I just turned and walked away. See, I wished him well. You're not fooling God. I don't even think you're really fooling yourself. And to be honest, this message was one of the more difficult that I've tried to work through in terms of content. Um, the, the concept is simple, right? I don't have to explain exactly what this means or how this works. I don't have to talk about the nuance of what this looked like 2,000 years ago in the ancient Near East and how that translates into your world and our culture. It translates exactly. Like nothing even has to be said on that. But... I really, I struggled for content. I tried to think of times where I had done something like this. Didn't really come up with much. But really, my, my probably default is if someone insults me is kind of just to shrug it off, which I think is not the worst thing, but it's certainly not doing this. 
Uh, I couldn't really think of anybody who I, I know of that would think of me probably as like a personal enemy. I tried to look up other stories of are there people or times where someone's done something like this, it's been awesome. I found nothing usable. About the best I did was I thought of a time several years ago when I was on staff at a little bit of a larger church in New Hampshire, and we had had an event in the evening, and it was out so outdoors, and there was music, and I didn't really think it was too late or too loud, but apparently somebody in the neighborhood did. And so when I came into the office the next morning, there was an angry message from somebody, and I, I don't remember her insulting us. I don't remember thinking that, well, now probably we're enemies, or she thinks of us as an enemy. And it was a little easier because this, this was completely impersonal. It had really nothing to do with me. Honestly, I thought the event was dumb, too. I didn't even like the event. I was halfway even on her side. But I, I recognized that she saw us as the offender, of course, and so I, I called her, and I apologized for the disruption. And I offered, like, hey, can we buy you a sandwich for lunch from the little the little restaurant that's on the corner here and near there. And that's the whole story. I would love it if it was a really good sandwich, and so now she loves Jesus and buys other people's sandwiches. <laughs> I don't, to my knowledge, that's, that's not the story. But when I thought about it, one thing that I did think about was that in, in the, the entire interaction, and again, it's a little easier because this really wasn't about me or directed toward me, but my concern was not at all for myself. My concern was for the reputation of the church, which was not only my employer, but also is an extension of and representation of Jesus Christ. And so I remember from the first moment, my train of thought was, okay, how can we take this incident now where she feels like she's having a very negative interaction with the church, and how can we make this into something positive where she sees the church, and by extension Jesus, something that is really genuinely for her and has her real good will at heart in something that's more than just uh, empty words and a simple apology. And what if we all did this as individuals? and thought of ourselves as ambassadors for and representatives of Jesus Christ, which is explicitly biblical, and concerned ourselves with whether or not people saw Jesus in us, whatever they think of us, but especially somebody, if they would see us as their enemy, or they insult us, if they saw us repaying them with a blessing if they saw us feeding them when they were hungry and giving them something to drink when they were thirsty. And when I say what if, probably there would be a very broad uh, spectrum of outcomes. Probably some people would take advantage of your kindness. Okay. Be ready to accept that as a possible outcome a portion of the time. Probably a lot more people would just be confused or not care or question your motives. All right, you're not responsible for their response, but you are responsible for your behavior. And so here's, as simple as this is, I think where the message goes from here is, is here's what we do. Don't skip over this. This is very important. Number one, decide I'm going to do this. There are things in life that just do not happen unless you make a specific, conscious, moment-in-time decision that it is going to happen. You're never going to take the big vacation if you don't block out some time on your calendar. You're never going to have money for a down payment on your house if you don't decide that you're going to, you're going to save and you're going to work. Like, otherwise, you'll just eat a bunch of nachos because that was what you had money for. And listen, if you're here and you hear a nice message about, yeah, okay, we're supposed to be good to people, and we're supposed to do nice things, and so on and so on, then I think it's extremely unlikely that anything is going to change in your life without a specific, conscious, moment-in-time decision that this is going to be real. I am done paying back insult for insult. That's not going to happen anymore. I know it probably won't be 100% any more than anything else is 100%, but you make the decision that from today, from right now, from this moment, my modus operandi is no longer paying back insult for insult or evil for evil. I am going to take the way of Jesus and pay back an insult with a blessing. It, don't make it about me or this message or life point crossing or certainly how anybody or everybody else in the world operates. This is take, something we're going to take as seriously as Jesus and the Bible take it. This is immediately off Jesus' mouth. This is immediately off the pen of the biblical author's 
plural. Make the decision. And then number two is to, to do it. Is there somebody in your life that this week, or even better today, if we don't do it, you will forget? Is there someone who, whatever you think of them, maybe you even like them, maybe you don't like them, but someone who you know would see you as an enemy? What is there that you can do today or this week to offer them some sort of a blessing, whatever that is? Just, is there a coworker that you can say or, or send a message to, something, just whatever genuine blessing you can offer them? Like, hey, you know, I, you're a really sharp dresser. I've, I've always thought you had really pretty blue eyes. Man, that is a cool car. I've noticed you're really good at your job. I, I hope you have a really good day today. Whatever would be a genuine, whatever is you can say. If, if your enemy's hungry, get him a sandwich. If your enemy's thirsty, get him a coffee or a slushy or whatever it is they like to drink. I, maybe those are corny. I'm getting old. I don't know, but you're smart. You can think of something. Whatever it is you can do, this is what Jesus calls being true children of our Father in heaven. This is what Paul calls conquering evil with good. Can you conquer evil with a slushy? How cool would that be? Who wouldn't want to do that? That's amazing. But do something today, this week, today if you can. And then you remember where this led. Paul said, Peter said that God will bless you for doing it. I don't think that necessarily means you find a 20 on the ground after every time that you do something nice for somebody. I don't know, it partially might even be next life blessing. I don't know how God's going to bless you. That's up to God, and I think you should feel probably pretty good about leaving that up to God. But I will say this for sure. The idea is not that God wants you to be miserable and taken advantage of. Right? Every element of following Jesus is not what you want to do or what sounds good or most appealing in the moment. That's why there's a series like this that we can have six messages for. But in the end, every time what Peter says, whether he says it or not is true, you will be blessed for doing it. I have regrets in life. Not one of them are from following Jesus or obeying God. So the story about the drive through from the beginning. The first time I read that, I laughed. It was really, it was pretty well written. It was well crafted, and it, it set me up very appropriately to be contrary to my expectation. I thought it was going to be a nice, probably somewhat corny little vignette about actually conquering evil by doing good. And so it caught me off guard when it turned out that it was kind of nefarious the whole time. If you hadn't heard it before, I hope it caught you off guard too, because you know that's not what you would expect to hear from Jesus or in church. But something in us liked it. Yeah, me too. You got the jerk back and drove away. Awesome. That's why we have to have teachings like this. That's, that's why we have messages like this. This is why it's re repeated three times in different ways and places in Scripture. Is because it is not normal. It is not easy. It is not default mode. Here's what's normal is paying back insult for insult. Here's what's normal is paying back evil for evil. Here's what's normal is loving your friends, hating your enemies. Normal's dumb. Don't do what's normal. Act as true children of your Father in heaven. Follow the clear, explicit, repeated message of Jesus and what it is to be one of his children. We'll finish this up next week. It'll be a little bit different, a little bit of a surprise. Okay, let's pray. Father, thank you so much that you repaid us good when we were evil. Thank you that we become your children because of nothing good that we did, but because when we were sinners and what Scripture calls your enemies, you treated us with unbelievable love like the world and the universe have never seen before or since. And still praying if you're here and you've never accepted that, if you've never taken that step to connect with God through Jesus Christ, this is your moment. Every one of us has sin. And there is nothing that a human being can do to repay their sin to the holy and perfect God. But that's why Jesus Christ came, lived a sinless life, and his death on the cross was in your place. 
to atone justice for your wrongdoing so that you could be forgiven and adopted as children in his family. If that's you right here, if, you, if you're in person, if you're watching online, you just pray and say to God out loud or even in your, just pray in your heart and he'll hear you. Say, God, I believe that Jesus Christ came and died and resurrected so that I could be forgiven and adopted as a child in your family. Please come into my life. Forgive me and adopt me. Begin to make me into the person you created me to be and give me the life that you have for me. And if you just did that for the first time, that's, that's not the words or the prayer that saves you. It's that you put your faith in Jesus. And you, through that faith, God's grace comes to you. You are a new spiritual creation. The best thing you can do from here is let somebody know you're not created to live this life in Jesus by yourself. You can go out to the, the point. That's just the corner in the lobby. Let the person there know the decision you made. We'll be able to follow up with you with some good next steps. If you're online, send us a message. It'll be the same. And those of us who have been living as followers of Jesus, this message is, is easy to understand. It's difficult to apply. We might even accept it sitting in a church service on a Sunday morning, but I know it is so much more difficult in the real world where the offenses are real and the emotions run high. Here's what it is is the very essence of following Jesus, the very essence of reflecting the glory of God and what he has done for us. There is really no way that we can argue with or take any exception to just passing on to somebody else what God has done for us. Will you right now between yourself and the Spirit of God, will you commit to making that decision that from here on, the way you work is going to be the way Jesus in Scripture calls to the way that God has worked with you? Father, we're so grateful that you have. We're so grateful to be your children, to be forgiven and adopted as your children. Will you give each one of us here the strength and the courage to be that to somebody else in our world, to be that to the enemies that see us in a negative light, that they would see you in us and that we would be you to them. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.